What's up, friends? Welcome back to another episode of the Steve Weatherford Show. Got a little sneak peek for you. Actually, more than a sneak peek. I'm going to give you the whole thing, but I want to give you a little context for what I'm going to share with you. Just recently, I was out in Arizona to host one of the events that we normally host at my house. It's called the Launching Pad Experience. It's the live experience of a 12-week discipleship program that we do at Champions in Christ Ministry. We were hosting out in Arizona at a friend's house named Joe Poloni. And while we were out there, I got a DM and an opportunity to sit down with a guy named Andy Elliott. And if you don't know who that is, he's really been blowing up on Instagram in the last like year or two. And he's a really inspirational, really passionate, motivational sales trainer. He throws these events and uh, workshops at his HQ out in Arizona. And so he invited me over to do a podcast and I don't think he knew too much about me. And so we sat down. I'm like, Hey Andy, how long do you want the podcast to be? He's like, man, give me like 30 minutes of like your, your best stuff. And I thought to myself, I said, well, my best stuff is my testimony. I just began to share my testimony. And about 15 minutes into me sharing my testimony, I looked over at my new friend, Andy Elliott, and I could see the Holy Spirit just landing on top of him. And the rest of the podcast was really powerful. So instead of going for 30 minutes, we went for like an hour. We ended the podcast episode with an invitation to Jesus. And then after the podcast, he's like, man, I was not expecting that. He's like, you know what, man? I feel like you need to stay one more day in Arizona because I've got 500 entrepreneurs and sales trainers that are coming in this weekend and they need to hear that radical story that you just shared with me. And so the video that you're about to share is what God did when I stayed and I shared my testimony and took that opportunity. The reason I want to share this with you is this is the first time that I've ever shared my testimony where every single person inside of that venue raised their hand and gave their life to Jesus. It was unbelievable. And so I just wanted to share this with you, that God would get all the glory, that it would increase your faith, that you would pray prayers, that God would have you in the right place at the right time with the right people so the right things would happen. And this just increased my faith. And I'm praying and believing that it will increase your faith. If this is the first time you've listened to the Steve Weatherford Show, make sure that you give us a thumbs up and hit the notifications on YouTube so you can make sure that you get an alert every single time that we come out with an episode every Wednesday morning. Today's episode of the Steve Weatherford Show is brought to you by Just Meats. I didn't say carbs, Just Meats. And you're wondering to yourself, well, what is Just Meats? Well, it's a meal delivery that comes straight to your front door, all natural, grass-fed, grass-finished. My family loves it, and it's become a part of our weekly dinner that one of the kids gets to choose. Are we doing beef? Are we doing chicken? Are we doing pork? Uh, And so we just love it because it makes things easy. It feeds my family. It feeds me. And I want it to feed you. So if you use code Steve15, go to justmeats.com and you'll save a lot of money. Enjoy the show. Arise, champion. This is the world famous Steve Weatherford Show, where each week we bring you stories, messages, and guests to create massive breakthroughs in your life. Somebody say greatness. This show has been strategically designed to accelerate you. Call a friend and tell them Steve Weatherford is home. I've only got an hour with you guys, and I wasn't actually planning on being here. Um, I actually came in town to uh, do some some coaching and some teaching, and I knew I was coming into Arizona. And I know Andy and I had messaged a few times. And so I said, I think I'm supposed to meet Andy on this trip. So I messaged him when I was on finalizing my trip plans. And he said, hey, I want you to come up here and and I'd love to meet you. And I didn't know we were going to sit down and do a podcast or anything. I just felt like him and I were supposed to connect. And we sat down. um, I might maybe talk to him. I don't know, Andy, where are you at? Andy, you know what? Where's he at? Would you come sit up here with me, man? I want to do this with you, man. Yeah, yeah come on, come on. I'm always um, learning. I feel like over there, I'm just like, like I'm watching it. But I'll, no, I'll it'll, get front it'll, row. it'll bless you. I know that you don't like, you're like me, man. I've gotten up like four or five times in the last two hours just because I like to move around. So thank you, everybody, for, for your attention. I just want to kind of set some context like, who am I and why am I here? And then I want to get into sharing something with you that I believe is absolutely going to change your life. And it's very actionable, it's very practical, but I want to share with you how I met Andy. So I came up here, we talked for maybe five or 10 minutes and we sat down for a podcast and I said, Andy, how long do you want this to go? And he said, man, um, give me like 
30 minutes of your greatest stuff, your best fire. And, uh, and I thought to him, I said, man, I've got, I've got a lot, but I feel like the greatest thing that I can share is my testimony, right? Yeah. And so I told, I told Andy, I said, man, I would just love to share my testimony and who I am with you. And I don't know, I haven't said this to Andy, but it was about 15 minutes into that 30 minute show where I was sharing my testimony and Andy, I looked at you and, and I could feel the presence of God just fall on you as I was sharing my testimony. And I could see a supernatural conviction come over you um, of just love and excellence, but wanting to be more. And, and it, Andy and I got done with the podcast. It ended up being about an hour, and I can't wait to share it with you guys. It was amazing. It was such an honor to sit with you. Um, I just admire you so much. And we went up to his office, and I got a chance to meet Jackie. And, um, you know, I've seen their stuff on social media for a couple of months. And, um, and Andy's like, man, I've been with you for two and a half years. I have, or two and, a half, two and a half hours. I haven't heard you say a curse word. And he said, do you cuss? And I was like, well, you know, every once in a while I make a mistake, but it is my aim to not, to not curse with my mouth. And he goes, why? And I said, it's not a heaven or hell thing. It's an excellence thing. And it's a discipline thing because the, there's a lot of people that God has put in my sphere for me to lead. And what I do in moderation, my followers may do in excess. And so I say those things to say, thank you for allowing someone to come alongside of you. And here's the deal. I never even challenged Andy. So I'm saying these things to honor him. He just asked something about me and he saw excellence and he saw he saw discipline show up in a different type of way. And so for that reason, I didn't even say anything to him. Two days later, he texts me or, or he calls me. He goes, you're never going to believe this, man. And it was preceded by me texting him the next morning. I said, Andy, when I was praying with you, did you feel the presence of God? And did, did God give you like a picture in your mind? And he replied back right away. He goes, bro, I feel the presence of God right now. And God gave me a picture of you in my life. And the reason that I say that is not to bring glory to myself. It's, it says in scripture, it's the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony that sets the captives free. And I believe that God is showing you a picture of possibility. And the thing that I love about Andy is he's, as I'm noticing, like he wants to walk it out, right? He's not a guy that's going to just give you words. I didn't even challenge him, but he saw an area where he could be more excellent. And it wasn't just about him. He told me, he's like, man, if I become more excellent and I discipline my tongue, I'm going to be able to reach more people and impact more lives. And that's going to open me up to a whole faction of, of a, a new age group and a new different types of person. Because there are people, Andy, that as soon as they hear the F word, they're turning the channel, right? So thank you for letting the Holy Spirit convict you into just excellent leadership and followable leadership in every single area. Because that takes humility, right? I mean, think about this. I mean, we're all on the internet interwebs, right? And I'm watching Andy's account go up by like 30 and 40,000 people every single day. It is no question that God has anointed you. It is no question that God has placed influence on you. It is no question that God has put you on the earth, not to just influence people and to be a fisher of men, but you're so dynamic because you're a disciple maker, man. You are men that are bringing families and men and women in, and you're teaching them how to live an excellent life, and you're not hitting them over the head with the Bible with it. And I believe that the change that you're making in your life right now, Andy, is going to bring you to your next level. And what do I mean when I say that? Everybody that walked in here, I believe that we are all praying and believing and investing this money, that if we come in here, we're going to learn something and we're going to begin to do something different. And when we begin to do something different, it takes us to our next level. Right. right? And I'll agree with you. However, what I've noticed in the last four to five years in my walk, in my faith walk, I have noticed God also take my influence and qualify me into rooms onto stages that I don't deserve that I'm not qualified for, but it hasn't been because of things that I started doing. My next levels have actually been unlocked, Andy, by the things that I stopped doing. And that's what you noticed in me, is you spent time with me and you said, hmm, there's something that this guy is not doing, and it's inspiring me. It's m making me want to be better, not just for myself, but for my wife, for my sons, for other people's wives and sons. And so I'm believing that in this room and on this weekend, that you've already taken down some notes. 
of some things that you need to start doing, and I'll 100% agree with those. I told Andy after he got done with this two-hour session, I'm like, Andy, I've never seen you present before. Buddy, I am blown away. There was so much value that you just blurted and like fire hosed out onto everybody here, and I am so impressed. I can't wait to see where God is taking you with the gifts that you've been given because it's going to blow people away, man. There was a text message that I sent him after that day that we spent together. And I think it was something along the lines of what God is going to do in you is going to change the population of eternity and it's going to create a wave of disciples for Jesus Christ. And I just know that that's in your future, man. So thank you for this honor of speaking into this tribe, man. One of the things that Andy said earlier, and I wrote it down, is he said, remove the amateur from the way that you speak. And I believe that my assignment here today isn't just to impact the way that we speak, although I think that that's incredibly important. As Andy was saying, it's communication. It's how we create connection. It's how we create relationships. It's how we create results and sales. But what I want to do today is, yes, I want to take your language and your communication from amateur to pro, but I actually want to take your marriage from amateur to pro. I want to take your lifestyle from amateur to pro. I want to take your relationships from amateur to pro. So if there's anybody in here that wants to go from amateur areas of your life, and Andy will tell you, I was an amateur with the way that I was speaking, and then I got convicted, and now I'm in my process of reconditioning my tongue. If you want to go from amateur to pro in one or multiple areas of your life, I want you to raise your hand up right now. Andy, this is the whole room. This whole room is fertile soil. That's what I told Andy. He said, man, would you stay? Would you stay one more day? Because I was supposed to fly home yesterday. And I thought to myself, he said, I've got 500 people and they are hungry, man. And if you come, I'll give you one hour and you can take them to church. And so the reason that I'm here is because the only way that I know to take you from amateur to pro is to share this testimony that I'm about to share with you because it is, it is radical. So before I do that, I want to show you guys a picture of my family. I think they have a, I, I text the, the AV department a picture of my family. So this is my family. These are the Weatherfords. So eight days ago, on February 10th, I, I celebrated 18 years with my wife. Uh, I've got six children, thank you. Uh, I've got four daughters, I've got two sons. You can hold your round of applause, man. Thank you, I appreciate it, but God did that. I just wanted to introduce your fam my family to you. And the reason that I, I'm, I'm doing that is because I'm saying no to, the, to one of the number one things in my life. And I'm investing another 24 hours in a strange city that I'm not from with people that I haven't met. And the reason that I'm doing that is because this matters so much to me. I remember where I was at five years ago because four years and 11 months ago, I had a radical encounter with God's presence. And I'm going to pray for us. Would that be okay yeah. if I pray for us? So before I pray for us, I want to share with you guys a scene from one of my favorite movies. I played football in New York for eight years for the Jets and the Giants. And I got really into like mafia movies. And there's this movie called The Bronx Tale. Have any of you guys seen The Bronx Tale before? Man, I love this tribe, man. These are my people. Nobody ever raises their hand that much. So there's this scene in The Bronx Tale and their main character's name is Sonny. He's like the main mafia guy that kind of holds it down in that small Italian block. Sonny, Sonny's got authority. Right When he speaks, people go. He establishes the rules and the standards of the neighborhood. In this one scene, the Hell's Angels come into the Bronx and they park all of their bikes right in front of Sonny's Bar. And Sonny's Bar is the place where all the wise guys hang out. So these Hell's Angels, about a dozen of them, come into the bar and they start breaking bottles and grabbing the bartender by the scruff of the neck and telling him, give us all these free drinks. And Sonny's sitting in the back of the bar drinking his cappuccino, and he sees this, and he stands up, and he walks up to these guys. He said, I'm glad that you guys are in my bar, and I want you to have a good time and, and have some drinks. 
But we have standards inside of this place that you will maintain. There are things that are allowed, and there are things that are not allowed. And what you're doing right now, it's not allowed. So he goes back, he sits in his chair. <laughs> Two minutes later, whoosh, people mother effing each other, you know, abusing his staff. So Sonny gets up. He walks to the front of the bar. He walks past the bar, walks to the front, and he locks the door. He looks at his friends in the back. They lock the door, and then they start to come out of the kitchen with bats and sticks and chains, and they beat the snot out of those hell's angels. And then they unlock the door, and then they throw them out. And the reason that I share that with you before I pray Is the door sealed? <laughs> okay, good. Before I pray, I want to tell you why I want to pray. Before I pray, I want to give you an opportunity to, like, to let the Holy Spirit, to let God convict you with some of the things that you've been carrying around that have been tormenting you, that have been stopping you, that have been limiting you, that have been keeping you in a cycle. And I'm going to read some of them off. These are notes that I wrote about 45 minutes ago. I didn't know what God wanted me to share here, so I just listened. I listened to what was shared, and I listened to the experience of this morning with Keaton. This is what God is telling me. He's telling me that people have walked into this place today, and they have so much shame about the divorces that they've been through. They have so much shame and guilt about depression, anxiety. I believe that unforgiveness, the reason some of you guys can't go to your next level it's because you don't forgive yourself. You've made mistakes in the past, and so the way that you look at yourself, you could never cast big vision like some of the way that Andy's doing or some of these other people that come in here and have done really amazing things. You have to be able to see yourself as worthy to do worthy things. Addiction has walked in here today. Suicidal thoughts have walked in here today, I know. I know that there are people that are in here who maybe have achieved some things, that they thought would fix that hole inside of their chest, and it didn't. And then they did another thing that they thought would fix it. Maybe they, they got their body strong. Maybe they made a lot of money. Maybe they said, when I marry this person or live in this neighborhood, I'm gonna feel okay. And then they get there, and then the elephant that was on their chest is still there. Ooh, man, I seen this one thick earlier, Andy. Where's my friend Travis at? The Vivint guy. Yeah, he's, he's licking his wounds right now, right? And you want to know why? It's not because he can't sell. It's because when he got up here, the fear of failure, it gripped him. And he forgot what to say. And for the other men that have gotten up here, fear of rejection. But ultimately, I believe what's walked in here is the fear of man. We have let so many of us have let the fear of what dad would say, the fear of what our friends would say, the fear of what Andy might say if I like, right? We can laugh about it, but that's the reason that he says this is so intense. Why? Because when you fail, you'll fail in front of everybody. I believe that idolatry has came, come in here today. And the only reason that I can have eyes to see idolatry, not adultery, not cheating on your wife, that's in here too. Idolatry. That means you have other idols that are above God. The only reason I can say I got eyes to see, man, that was me. My body was my idol. My bank account was my idol. My brand was my idol. My finances were my idol. And I always told myself, well, when I get this right, I think I'll feel okay. How about lust and perfectionism? How about procrastination? How about accepting average? That's walked through the door today. How about rejection? How about abandonment? Those have walked in here today. So I'm going to pray a prayer. And before I pray this prayer, I want to share a Bible verse with you that means so much to me. It's Romans 8.28. And I want you guys to all write it down. Just write down Romans 8.28. You could look it up later. But in Romans 8.28, it says that God will take all things from our past, use them together for our good, 
for those that love him and those that are called according to his purpose. So in that promise, it says, if you release it and give it to God, everything that's happened in the past, that gives God permission to use it together for good for those that love him and those that are called according to his purpose. So let me ask you this question. This is a qualifying question. Let me do a little sales real quick. Let me get you into a qualify. If things have happened in your past and you're noticing as I'm saying it, dang, I've been addicted. Dang, I've been divorced. Dang, I've been bankrupt. Dang, I've been depressed. Man, I've, I've even had a suicidal thought before. And you want to give all of that up and you want God to use it together for good, I want you to close your eyes right now, and I want you to raise your hand, and I want you to say, that's me. Everything from my past, that's like 30% of the room. So you're telling me there's only 30% of us inside of here that have something heavy that we're, that we're carrying? That's right. That's the rest of our room. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, before we ask anything of you, because God, we're going to ask a lot today. God, we just proclaim that you're king. God, we thank you for your awesome power, your glory, your mercy. God, we thank you for each and every one of your sons and your daughters that are here sitting in the seats right now. God, we know that it's a divine, it's a divine appointment today, that every single one of these people are, are exactly where their feet are at. So God, we thank you for this moment, and we just ask that your Holy Spirit would go before us. God, that today would be the day. God, when generational curses, things that were given to these men and these women that they didn't agree to, God, that they have been put on them, God, we just pray that you would take those things away. Every single person in here said, God, I give you permission by raising their hand. So God, we just ask that you would take everything from our past. God, that you would use it together for good for those that love you and we love you. I need everybody to say, God, I love you. I love you. God, I love you. God, you hear that thunderous noise in Fountain Hill, Arizona. God, we just ask that you would open heaven up. God, that the words that come out of my mouth, God, that they would be hearing from God and not from a man. God, that you would convict them in their spirit and they would know the things to lay down that would take them from amateur to pro. The self-limiting beliefs, the, 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 the cycles of addiction. God, we thank you that your miracle working power is available in every single one of them the people that are in this place right now. God, they've given you permission that your favor can fall down in this place. God, that signs, miracles, and wonders are something that we believe in. If you believe in it, say, I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. God, your sons and your daughters are ready for more. I want you guys to say, more of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on. All right. Okay. So before I get into my testimony, I feel like there's a specific word that I'm, I'm supposed to release, and I captured it from my friend Dylan yesterday. I had some quiet time this morning, and I said, God, what's the word? Like, what's the intention? What's the thing that I'm going to impart into this room? And I feel like what God said to me, is God said that they must ex excavate before they can elevate. And I want you to write that down. God wants the next 45 minutes to be excavation time. God wants you to dig deep. God wants you to be willing. God wants you to, in the next 45 minutes, if you're not already there, God wants you to get to the end of yourself. He wants to dig up all of the past, just like we talked about in Romans 8, 28. Give God your past. Quit carrying it around because he wants to give you hope in a future. So there's going to be three steps that I'm going to ask everybody. Remember, I said this is going to be practical, tactical. And sometimes when people talk about God, it's just kind of like it's all over the place. I want to be actionable, and I want to be practical. I'm going to ask you guys to take three steps. Say one, two, three. Ready? One, two, three. Three steps. And in those three steps, you're going to get three things. And so I want you to write these three things down that you're going to do and three things that you're gonna get. Today, today you're gonna release, you're gonna receive, and you're gonna commit. You're gonna release things that don't belong to you, and I want you to write this scripture down too, Romans 12, 2. And in that scripture it says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I believe that that's, the, that's really what this weekend is about. Andy Elliott has gathered people together so he can interrupt your life and interrupt the way that you think. And I believe that God sent me here to confirm that and to plant a seed, right? So in the release, in the receive, and in the commit, we're gonna get these three things. We're gonna get freedom. There was a lot of bondage that walked in here, and I believe that free men and women are gonna walk out. Freedom, you're gonna get identity. And I believe that a lot of identity that have walked in is the identity of the world, meaning the world has conformed you. The world has convinced you that you can't do some of the things that are in your heart and your belly. You know you're meant to do, but you keep stumbling over yourself and then you view yourself as your results. And so your, your identity is completely busted. And then we're gonna get authority. <laughs> Andy, say authority. Authority, say it again, authority. 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 Okay, so the way we're going to get authority, right? The way that we're going to step into authority, the way that Sonny stepped into an authority, and he says, this doesn't belong here. It has to go. We have to make a decision. Write down the word decision. The root of the word decision means to cut off. And so at the end of our time here today, I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. And in that prayer, we're going to make a decision to cut things off. The same way that Andy said, I'm not saying the F word ever again, right? He has made a declarative statement and he is going to recondition himself that he will not curse with his mouth anymore, but he will create. Because in scripture, it says death and life is in the power of the tongue. And I know that he's a creator. I know that you're a creator. But in order for us to go from amateur to pro, we have to stop making decisions based upon our flesh, right? That's why a lot of us, me included, that's why I got into porn. That's why I got into, that's why I got into cursing. That's why I got into making money my identity. That's why I got into drugs. Because I would achieve things and then it didn't make me feel the way that I thought it was supposed to make me feel. And so part of the coping mechanism was alcohol, drugs, or porn. My flesh was running the show. But in order for me to go from amateur to pro in every area of my life, because if you look at my Wikipedia page, I'm a Super Bowl champion. I'm the NFL's fittest man twice. I was a Walter Payton Man of the Year award. Played for 10 years, Super Bowl champion. But what y'all didn't know about me is I was addicted to porn. I was addicted to pills that I was sexually abused when I was 12 years old and it created, it created like a perspective shift in me and I looked at my identity and I'm like, man, if, if, God is, if God is real, how could he let something like this happen to me? Does this make me gay? And because I didn't have intimacy with my father to know what my real identity is, I got conformed to this world. So I thought the only way that I can be worthy is if I achieve a lot of things. So as you guys see me and you stand up, you'll be like, man, this guy's really jacked. This was born out of massive insecurity. And now I use it for the glory of God. So there's four verses I want y'all to write down. You've already written down two of them. You wrote down Romans 8, 28. You wrote down 12, Romans 12, 2. I want you to write down John 10, 10. John 10.10 10 says, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it says, Jesus has come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. So in this scripture, I believe that the enemy has stolen your freedom. And I believe that he's killing, he's killing your identity. And then he's destroying your inheritance. Because I believe that a lot of the reason that men and women are in this room right now isn't just for themselves. How many, of you, how many of you have families that depend on you? This is a room of chain breakers, man. This is a room of generation ones. I love and I honor my father, but what I'm doing with my last name is next level. How many of us want to have a next name that because of us, we take it next level? It's time for us as a tribe in the earth to go from amateur to pro. 
But until we get clear on what our commitments are, we can never be a pro. Because amateurs make decisions on their feelings, and pros make decisions based upon their commitments. And before I came into Andy, Andy Elliott's life, he hadn't made a commitment to discipline his tongue. So what does it look like for us to leave this place so clear on who we are, whose we are, and then we're going to know what to do next? Because I believe a lot of people have come into this room wondering the what. I came in here as my marketing. Am I in the wrong business? How do I go next level? I need a new what. But I believe what you're realizing right now, it's not about the what. It's about the who. Because once you know who you are, your identity, once you know who you are and whose you are that you belong to God, you're always going to know what to do. Say this with me. Who, who. whose, who's. And, what. and what? That's what we're going to get clear on today. I believe that if the only thing that I'd get you to do is agree with God's opinion of you, if I can get you to agree with how God feels about you and you walk out of this door, I know that you're walking in freedom. I know that you're walking in authority. And I know that wherever you go, that you are going to positively impact that place with the time, the talents, and the treasures that God has put in you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Hey, Andy, I like your tribe, man. Come on, man. You told, you did. In Jeremiah 29, 11, I'll share this verse and then I'm gonna get into some defining moments. Jeremiah 29, 11. And in that scripture, boy, I, like I anchor myself on this because sometimes there's, there's things that happen in life and I can't see God's hand in it. I couldn't see God's hand in, in a teacher that really built me up and encouraged me and made me feel special. I didn't realize he wasn't, he wasn't encouraging me. He was grooming me. I couldn't see how at 12 or 13 years old, that God's got plans for me if he could let something like that happen. But when I don't know what God is doing, I re-remind myself of the promise from God because these four things that I've shared with you, those are four promises from God. And in scripture, there's 7,437 promises from God. And I just shared four of them with you, but these are my favorite. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So even though it was so hard, guys, it was so hard to look back at what I experienced at 12 years old. And I know I'm not the only one in here that's experienced abuse of some kind. It was so hard for me to think to myself, if God is real and God is good, how could he let something like that happen? I had wounds. I had wounds that made me feel different about myself. I had wounds that wouldn't let me connect with love, right? Because I, th I thought to myself, man, if these people, they knew what I've been through, the things that I've done, the, the lies that I've told, the women that I've slept with, the drugs that I've done, Andy wouldn't love me. He wouldn't want to be my friend. And these people who think I'm this big, shiny football guy that does entrepreneur, they wouldn't love me. They would, they would turn their back and they would leave the room. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do, is he wants to convince you that if you share that broken part of yourself, if you share that wound, then people will run away. But you know what God has shown me? He has shown me that that thing that happened when I'm 12, when I share that in a room, it sucks the air out of the room. And people all of a sudden are like, oh my gosh, this guy's not here to talk about his bright, shiny trophies. This guy is here to share his, his darkest things with me. And the reason I want to share some of the darkest moments of my life is because that wound is not a wound anymore. It's a scar. And when I pull it up and I show other people who have been through pain, it gives them permission to heal. And it gives them permission to talk about that thing that happened and what God did and what I'm doing now. That's a testimony. So I know that I'm in a room. I don't even have to ask you guys to raise your hand. I already know that I'm in a room of renegades. I already know that I'm in a room of rebels. I already know that I'm in a room of like misfits and lost boys. These are people that don't fit in. And I, that's why I knew that this would be such fertile soil, right? Because there are some churches, guess what? Then we'll let a guy like me on the stage. And I don't blame him because I don't do church like normal people. I'm here to burn bright for the king of kings. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when I get invited to a business seminar like this, and I can see things walk into a room, do you think I'm the type of idiot that's going to give you a band-aid for your gunshot wound? 
I want to give you healing. I want to give you transformation. And the only way that that can happen is if you release things that don't belong to you and stop carrying them around. And if you receive something that you could never earn and you commit to something bigger than you. So my earliest memories, I felt like a renegade and a lost boy. Kindergarten was my earliest memories where I was like, dang, man, I'm different. I've got two brothers and I've got a sister and they're just, they're good. They don't, they don't, they've never done drugs. They didn't have sex till they got married. I've got parents that were the same way. And then there's me, right? I love WWF and just radical things. And I grew up in a, like a really religious church. So I honor, I honor my mother and my father. They're amazing people. They're still married to this day, almost 50 years. So like I am a product when I say I'm a gen one, I think I'm like a gen, generation one radical, but I'm definitely not a generation one faith. I've inherited that from my family, but there were 36 years, guys. As I speak to you now, I've only really been saved for almost five years, not even quite. I had a radical encounter four years and 11 months ago because I grew up in the church. But every time I went to church, I'd get kicked out of Sunday school. Who gets kicked out of Sunday school, man? Isn't that the place everybody's supposed to be welcome? And then I go to kindergarten and there's 27 people in my class and I'm thinking to myself, there's gotta be at least one other weirdo in here. So the first five days of kindergarten, I'm the only one that got to the sent to the principal's office five days in a row. And it was Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where they could spank you without calling dad. So we can laugh right now, right? Because I'm 41 years old and I'm walking in full freedom, full security, no fear of man, no fear of failure, because my ultimate goal is, and Keith kind of talked about earlier, I know that there's one day that I'm going to stand before God with my time. Three things, and I want you to write these things, three things down, because Keaton talked about standing before God, and I want to take that a little bit of a, a layer deeper. There's going to be three things that God is going to want to review with you, your time, your talents, and your treasures. And so I have a sense of urgency because I've tried everything else there is in the world. For 36 years, I was a ronin. I traveled the earth, going from mission to mission, make it onto the varsity team in high school, develop my body from 100 pounds to 225 pounds, earn a college scholarship, make it to the pros. And with almost every single one of those achievements, I remember taking the achievement and going back to my earthly father and bringing it to him and, and asking him, like, dad, is it good? The next defining moment I really feel like like sticks out to me. So I talked to you guys about like five years old. And honestly, I started hating myself at five because I'm so different. If you guys haven't noticed, I got what the educators call a, a learning disability, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, right? They think I have an attention problem. I have an attention problem. I have an interest problem. If it doesn't interest me, I can't pay attention. And I believe that the world tried to conform me to say I'm broken. I can almost guarantee you that this room is at least 50% ADHD. 80%. He knows better than I do, right? We're creators. We're not built like everybody else. And you know what it says in scripture? I shared this with Andy. He was like, I could see the blood. Your vascularity increased when I shared this scripture with him. Creation is groaning for the sons of God to reveal themselves. The world is conforming us every single day. We see Super Bowl commercials and all the craziness that's going on. Creation is groaning for men like us to stand up in our true identity according to Christ and to walk in a full freedom and an authority that sets other people free. And I believe that's the activation that can happen inside of this room. So at eight years old, I remember, I remember scoring like five goals in a soccer game. My dad was the coach. And as I'm walking off of the field, it was the first time that I remember being really encouraged. There were three or four different parents that came up to me and they're like, Steve, you weren't on this team last year and we got beat three to nothing by these guys and we just stomped them five to nothing and you're the X factor. You're a difference maker. I was like, oh, wow, thank you. Then I walk a little bit further and then this next parent comes up to me and be like, Man, I have never seen somebody with so much energy. You are literally all over the field. Steve, you're amazing, man. I was like, oh, thank you. 
because I grew up with a Clint Eastwood type of dad, right? Loved me, faithful. But he didn't say, I'm so proud of you, Steve. You're such a good boy. And I know it's really hard for you to sit still, but your effort inspires me. I love you. You're a good boy. I didn't hear those types of things from my dad. You want to know, it created a little bit of an identity issue. I wasn't real sure who I was. And I remember the next parent coming up to me and saying, Steve, thank you so much. My chubby little son, Jacob, has never scored a goal in three seasons. And because of you, we're going to go have a pizza party, Steve. You're amazing, teammate. And I remember getting in the, in the car with my dad. And I'm like, I'm feeling seven foot tall. I'm like, dad, dad, am I those things that they say that I am? And I remember because my dad was ill-equipped, because he didn't have a daddy that said, proud of you, man. You're a good boy. My dad put the car into reverse, and I hear the crunching of the rocks underneath the, the, the pavement. And I remember him saying to me, you need to just focus on what you can control. And I remember in that moment at eight years old, that in that moment of me needing to, I needed confirmation that I'm a good boy and that you love me, I'm re-reminded of what I lack. And that's what the world loves to do for us. A lot of you all came in here because you think it's a lack or you think it's a weakness while you're not at your next level. And that may be the case, but I believe that you'll get over your weakness, you'll get over your addiction if you know who you are right? It's an identity issue. It's not an addiction issue. And so at 11 years old was the next like really big defining moment for me. I mean, radical. I grew up in like a really stiff church. 50 people stand up, sit down. If you talk, you got smacked in the back of the head. And I got invited to a different church. This church, this church I walked in and it was like people like you guys, cut off t-shirts, tattoos, like real people muscles. And I looked on the stage and there was fire on the stage. There were steel bars on the stage. And the main guy comes out, his name's Keith Kraft. And he comes out, he says, welcome to the power team. Have any of you guys seen the power team before? There's a few hands. So what the power team is, it's like five or six or seven guys that look like me, but even bigger. They look like WWF wrestlers. And they would go from city to city and they would do like high school events and go to churches and they would do these incredible feats of strength, breaking bricks in Jesus' name, bending bars over their head, taking handcuffs and busting them. So I'd never seen anything like this in the church before. So I walked in with my dad. I'm like, is this legal, dad? And he was like, yeah. I think to myself, why don't we freaking go to church like this? Our church sucks. So I, I ran up to the front row and I'm like right there, Andy. And for the next 90 minutes, it is the most unbelievable thing that I've ever seen. Cause there's no, there was no YouTube back then, right? So I had never seen people that big unless it was Hulk Hogan or the ultimate warrior. And so I see these guys standing right in front of me that are literally larger than life. And at the end of the, the event, the main guy, Keith Kraft comes out and he shares his testimony. And for my whole life up until that point, I didn't want anything to do with church or God. Because when I went to my church, if you drove a Cadillac, everybody in the church would turn their nose up at you. If you, had, if you were like strong and, 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 and assertive, that wasn't very Christian. You need to be humble and you need to be weak. And I'm like, man, like I, I get this God thing, but I don't want to be like that. I want to be like Hulk Hogan, like the ultimate warrior, man. And I, I came into this concert and I'm seeing somebody that looks like the ultimate warrior, but he's talking about God. And he gave me permission that I could be a bold, strong, and successful man of God. I didn't have to do an either or. Remember that mentor told you, you got to pick one or the other, buddy. And I saw the two worlds come together. And I was like, I want that. So <laughs> he put on two pairs of handcuffs. He counted down from 10 to one. He said, these chains represent the bondage that the enemy has on you. And I'm going to break these to prove God's power and love. But I want you to know, if you feel like you've never fit in and you feel like you're just not enough and you want to belong to God, I want you to repent of your sins and I want you to raise your hand up and give your life to Jesus. And so he broke those chains and I threw both of my hands up. I'm like, I want that. And so I remember receiving Jesus, feeling like going home floating on clouds. My mom didn't have to tell me to read my Bible. I belong to God. You didn't have to tell me to tell, say my prayers. I belong to God. And then six months later, I had that teacher I told you about. It really encouraged me. Had me stay after class so he could help me. 
And then he sexually abused me. He stole my innocence from me. And I was just looking for a man to encourage me. I, I, I experienced so much darkness, so much depression, so much confusion. I don't even know if I'm gay yet because I don't have a close relationship with my dad. I can't say dad like, you know that God they talk about at church? Why didn't he protect me? I thought that you said he was good. How could God use something like this for anything good? I feel so broken. I feel so dirty. And so I went into high school and I started high school at 108 pounds. And would it be okay if I go five minutes long? Okay, I want to share this story with you. The first time, the first time that I ever played football, I was 14 years old. It was two years after this abuse. And I was always a pretty athletic guy. But the way that I played football, and I believe that this story will resonate with you, and maybe the first time you, you did something that God was really calling you to do that would unlock your life. So this, this, the football coach comes over to the soccer field in Terre Haute, Indiana. His name's Wayne Stale. He asked the coach, he's like, hey, do you have a, a kicker with a strong leg? Because we don't have one. And he said, yeah, two, two fields over, there's a guy named Steve Weatherford. He's a freshman. He's got a rocket for a leg. So the coach walks over, and he gets a little closer to me, Andy, and at the time, 108 pounds. And he looks at me and looks back at the coach. He's like, this guy? And the coach is like, yeah, 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 have him kick the ball. So he said, hey, take that ball and kick it. So I backed up. I'm like, this guy's bigger than God at my school. This is Terre Haute, Indiana. Like, the, the football coach never comes on to the soccer field because that's where the fairies play. <laughs> so I'm so excited for my chance. So I kick the ball, boom. And coach looks back to the soccer coach. He goes, he'll do. So the very next day, I go to practice. And they go to try to put some football pads on me. And they put one pad on, too, too big. Another pad, another pad. By the time they, I got my pads, I was wearing seventh grader pads and an XL helmet, and I weighed 108 pounds. So I kind of like waddle out to practice because I never wore pads like that before. And coach says, hey, bring it up. He's like, this is our new kicker, Steve Weatherspoon. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm so scared. I'm 14 years old. I'm so insecure. I mean, just, and the guys look at me and they, they go, oh, to the coach. And coach is like, no, nah, we're going right into field goal. This guy can do it. So I back up and the long snapper, the long snapper is the biggest, toughest guy in the school. He looks like he'd hang out with you with the cowboy hat on. His name was Mike Canada. He was 275 pounds, barrel chested, beer belly, and he chewed tobacco during practice. This guy was like the ultimate BA. He ran the school. So he's my long snapper, biggest, toughest guy in the school. And then we have our quarterback. His name's Chris Farr. He's like the most handsome guy in school. So I got the most handsome, popular guy in school and the guy that runs the school. And I'm standing in front of the varsity team. So I'm like, oh, this is my shot. This is my, so I'm back here like a raging bull, but I look like a golf ball on top of a tee. And I'm like this, getting ready to kick, trying not to fall over. So I look at Mike Cannon, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. So he looks at Chris Farr, he snaps the ball. I'm like, this is my shot. Take a step in, and I kick that ball. Boom! And the next thing that I hear is Mike Cannon go, oh! Because the ball never got more than two feet off of the round. And I gave a Wilson tattoo to Mike Canada's right butt cheek. He jumps up. His eyes are so red. And, he, and this is a true story. He chases me off of the field in Terre Haute, Indiana, into the locker room. And I'm not kidding you. I got the helmet. I went back into the locker room. I gave it to the manager. I gave him my pads. I said, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I left. The, and the reason that I tell you that is, you're like, wait a second. You quit football. I thought you went to the NFL and like you got a Super Bowl right now. So I had somebody come up to me the next morning and be like, dude, we've got a game in four days. We don't have a kicker. And I'm like, yeah, but Mike Cannon is going to kill me. He's like, listen, go across the street. On Tuesdays, there's this lady named Betty. She'll, share, she'll sell you Copenhagen. Go buy five cans of Copenhagen. Go up to Mike Canada and say, hey, I'm really, really sorry. Can I be on the team? And that's exactly what I did four days later. Very first football game ever. I had a 49-yard game winner to win the game. And I say those things to you to say, I don't know what special gifting has God has placed in your heart. I don't know the treasures that he's bestowed upon you. I don't even know how much time God has put on the earth. But I do know that the enemy wants to stop it before it starts. And if I wouldn't have had enough courage to try again, I wouldn't have a Super Bowl ring. 
I wouldn't be invited to come here and share defining moments from my life. God has qualified me so many different, into so many different rooms and opportunities because I didn't quit. And so that's one of the lessons in the defining moments of my life that I believe I want that to speak to you. I want that to speak to you in a deep, deep way because I believe that this visit that I have with you can dream can breathe life into dry bones. I believe that there are actually things that you are meant to do that you quit on. Andy was mentioning some of them. He's like, you think you need to be in a different business? You need to do the business that you're doing now better. You need to go from amateur to pro. And so I'll zoom through high school and college. I played four sports. I graduated all state. And all of them, I remember going to my dad and telling my dad, dad, I'm the first Weatherford that ever got a college scholarship, man. Is that unbelievable? And he said, hey, that's great. I think that's wonderful. You're the first one in the family. But I want to remind you that if you get caught doing some of the stuff that you're doing right now, drinking and running around, he said, they'll take that scholarship from you and you won't be the first one. And so it's just so reminiscent of those different times when I bring this, I bring this achievement to my earthly father and, and nothing goes down, nothing changes in me. And so in college, I didn't, it wasn't enough to play one sport. I had to play too, so I decided I'm going to run track too. I became a decathlete, right? And I was just sharing this with Andy when we did a podcast, and I want to speak on it because you spoke on it earlier about, man, you got to choose one or the other. And I believe that I lived my life like there was only three events that mattered. I want to show up for my career. I want to show up for my finances. I want to show up for my body. And if I have time, I'll show up for my wife and kids, and I'll show up for God. But there were really only three events that were important to me. I was idolizing those three events. But what I've realized since God's got a hold of me is there's actually 10 events. There's 10 events in the game of life. I'm not going to go through what they are, but, but I, want, I want that to be spoken as an analogy because what I learned in college, because I, like, I got like fourth or fifth place in every event. I didn't win the high jump. I didn't win the javelin. I wasn't the best pole vaulter. I wasn't very good at the 400, but I got fourth or fifth in every single event. And when it came time to add all the point totals up, I crushed everyone. And I believe that's a picture for how we can be the world champion version of ourselves. I'm believing that this weekend allows you to get around some mighty men and mighty women of God so you can see what events am I not showing up for? Because you can get nine, you can get first place in nine out of the 10 events, but if you don't show up for your marriage, you're gonna lose. Because I, I couldn't tell you how many people that, that make it billionaire status, you do too, that make it billionaire status and their wife comes up to them and said, hey, thank you so much for your sacrifice. You've worked so hard, the private jets, the multiple homes. Thank you so much, but I don't love you anymore. And like, I'm gonna take the kids. I'm gonna head a different direction. That would crush me. And that would crush all of us. That's why we do what we do. And that's why I'm here to put you on notice, to start to show up in your relationship with your physical fitness. Start to show up with financial stewardship and quit blowing all your money. Show up as a pro in your relationship with God. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to step into that today. Show up for the event of your marriage. Show up for the event of your relationships. Every single one of these events matter and some of us disqualify ourselves from even showing up because we can't put up a good point total. Well, I don't wanna pray next to Steve. Like... He's like a nine out of 10 in his faith. So then you don't, you don't even try. You don't even show up because you're comparing your chapter four to somebody else's chapter 24 when God has gifted you special in a different area, but you're disqualifying yourself from being a world champ because you don't show up. And I believe that that stops this weekend. So the next really big defining moment of my life, February 5th, 2012, Indianapolis, Indiana, we're playing Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. And I had the greatest game of my life. It's 47 miles from my hometown. I set a Super Bowl record for most punts inside the 10-yard line. After my first punt, the very next play was a safety in the end zone on Tom Brady. So I say those things, not so like you guys think I'm amazing. Because some of those games as a punter, I didn't impact them at all. Matter of fact, some games that I played in, I didn't even punt and they gave me a paycheck. And I'm like, dude, I'm freaking stealing, you know? <laughs> But in this particular game, my team needed me and I executed. It literally couldn't have had a better game. And I remember after the, the party was over, 
I go back to my hotel room at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I walk, drop my bag, and I hear a noise up at the window. And I'm on the 17th floor in Indianapolis. And I look down, and it's an ocean of people. And they're partying, they're high-fiving, they're taking selfies. And I notice they don't even have Giants jerseys on. They're just happy to be in a place where something great happened. And I'm 17 flights up. I had the greatest game of my life and the biggest game of my life. I know that three weeks from, from then, I'm going to get a multi-million dollar deal and a Super Bowl ring a few weeks after that. Literally everything I ever could have wanted. And I remember that realization, but I didn't feel any different. And this wave of depression came over me. And I realized that there's nothing inside of the NFL that's going to fix this God-sized hole inside of me. So I played three years of a five-year deal, retired out of nowhere. My wife, my mentors, my friends are like, what are you doing? You're walking away from $2 million a year for punting. It's punting. But I knew that there was like a God-sized hole inside of me, and I knew that I had to figure out how to fill it. So I retired. I went out to San Diego, California, and this is where my story gets supernatural. So if you haven't listened to any other wisdoms that I've shared, please lean into this. This is unbelievable. So I get to San Diego. Within two weeks of me getting there, I get invited to this church. At the time, it was called C3. Now it's called Awaken. I get there, and I'm like on the verge of divorce. My oldest son, Ace, resents me. I'm addicted to Adderall to keep up with the workload of entrepreneurship. I'm smoking weed to go to sleep. I'm chewing up Percocets when I'm sad and I'm lonely and I'm feeling rejected or depressed. And I know the only solution is God, but I just like, like, like what about God? So I got invited to this church and I showed up at this church five minutes late on purpose because I didn't want people to recognize me. I didn't want those, you know, those cheerful church people that meet you at the door. Hey, how are you? I didn't want none of that. No, you guys are laughing because you know I'm right. So I showed up five minutes late and I walked in. And as soon as I walked in, I felt like, like this energy. And I was like, and I look over. It's about 400 people in there. And there's like 150 people at the front of the stage. They got their hands raised up. Some of them are crying and they don't care about what anybody thinks about what they look like. They are just, it looks like it's just them and God. It's like, well, that's different. So I end up finding like a dark corner, a left corner. And I walk up there with my wife, and we're obviously not doing very good, but we know that's got to be God for the solution. So I sit there for the next two worship songs, and I'm watching people cry out to God with no fear of judgment. And I'm like, man, this is a different church than I grew up in. So then the pastor walks out. His name's Dr. Matt Hubbard. And he walks out, and he's talking for 60 seconds. And all of a sudden, he pauses. He looks up into the top left corner where it is very dark. He goes, hey, I don't know who you are, but God's telling me right now that you've been gone for a really long time, and God wants to tell you that you're home and that he's going to heal what's broken inside of you. And he continued to talk, and I looked around because I was like, I wonder who you're saying that to. But there was nothing behind me but the wall, and I knew he was speaking to me. So here I am, I walk into this church, and I'm searching for God. I walk into this church trying not to be noticed just so I can kind of window shop. And all of a sudden, a spotlight that was on the pastor goes right up to the left corner. And as this guy is talking to me, he's, everything he's saying is just speaking to my broken heart. So church gets over, and I walk out 10 minutes early so nobody talks to me. And I get into the car, and I'm like, babe, did that guy like recognize me? Or did he hear from God? She's like, I don't know, but that was wild. So we continue to go back to that church. Two months later, I get invited to this men's conference. It's called Emerge. And I'm, this is an open invitation for anybody that's here that wants to go to that event with me. I have a team that I put together. And this event changed my life. So I, I show up at this event, and I bring my, I got special permission for my 11-year-old son. His name is Ace. He's 16 now. I got special permission for him to come. And we go out to this event, and it's about 2,000 men in the middle of the desert in San Diego. And they gave us this board that had two holes on the end of it. And they gave it to me and they gave it to my son. They gave us a marker. And they said, I want you to write down everything on this board that you brought into the desert that you want God to take away. And guys, I took this thing and I went and sat alone and I wrote down porn. I wrote down pills. I wrote down imposter syndrome. I wrote down depression. I wrote down anxiety. I wrote down suicide. I wrote down imposter syndrome. I wrote down lust. I wrote down addiction. I wrote down am I gay. I, wrote, I was at the end of myself. 
And I just wrote it all down. I said, God, I just want you to take this. So then they had a string that was attached to it, and I put it on. And we're walking to this circus tent to hear the first speaker of the two-and-a-half-day weekend. And I walk in, and I felt that same energy. I walked in. I'm like, there's 2,000 men with their hands raised up, just crying out. I'm like, man, this is different, man. This is not like a normal church. So I sit down. Worship finishes. And then this really big pastor walks out, and they announce him as the speaker. Big old guy, white head of hair. And he walks up, and he grabs a microphone. And as, and as soon as he speaks into the microphone, I felt like I got hit by like a lightning bolt. And my chest started to get hot, and the hair on the back of my, my neck stood up. And I looked at my son to see if something was happening to him. He was just sitting there. And I look at my friend Nick Unsworth that invited me, and he's picking his nose. And I'm like, okay, it's only me. I feel like I'm levitating out of my chair. I recognize that voice. So he gets done preaching for five or 10 minutes. And I look at my friend as I'm still like, I still feel like I'm vibrating. I'm like, Nick, what's this guy's name? And he like ruffles around with the program. He's like, uh, Keith Kraft. I didn't recognize the name, so I'll Google it. And the third image that pops up on Google is a picture of the guy that's standing before me in 1994, busting a brick in Jesus' name with the mullet on the back of his head. And I'm like, that's the guy from when I was 11 years old. And my mind is racing. So he gets done preaching, and I can't hear anything that he says. Have you guys ever seen the Muppet Babies? You know the Muppet Baby's mom when he talks to, to, to Kermit or Miss Piggy? It's wow, 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 wow. I felt like I was hearing a sermon through water. My whole body was still vibrating. So he gets done preaching. I run around the side of the tent, and I'm throwing people out of the way in biblical fashion to get to the hymn of the rabbi. And I get up to him. I said, Pastor Keith, you're never going to believe this. When I was 11 years old, I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and you gave me a picture of possibility. Because of you, I gave my life to Jesus, and it hasn't been a good, it hasn't been an easy road, but man, you unlocked me for possibility in my body, in my finances, and I just like vomited my entire Wikipedia page on him so he could hear everything that I did. I'm like, man, thank you so much. And he was probably like really weirded out. So I walk back to my chair, and I feel like I'm walking on clouds. And I had three revelations about God that were the biggest questions that I had. I knew in that moment, I knew that God was real. I knew it. I knew in that moment because of the joy and the peace and the love that I was feeling in that moment radiating from me. I knew that God was good. And I knew that God was operating outside of time for this moment. So I walked back to my chair and I find my friend Nick Unsworth. And I'm like, Nick, you're never going to believe this story. But right before I was about to unpack it to him, I realized I lost my son. I don't have my 11-year-old son. Where did he go? And then he stops me and goes, dude, I was going to tell you, but the look on your face, I've never seen you look this way. He said, look at the front. And I go to the front of the, I, I look at the front of the event, and my son is standing there just like this receiving Jesus at 11 years old for the first time. And it was the same messenger that brought me to Jesus when I was 11 years old, 25 years apart. So my mind is blown. Yeah, praise God. So my mind is blown. Not only did God recapture and arrest my heart, he captured my son. But the only bummer is, I still got questions like, am I gay on my back? I still got questions about imposter syndrome and depression and anxiety. And here's the deal. Like I had, I had nightmares. I would wake up sweating. I would have anxiety like in big spaces like this. So the very next day, they had the biggest bonfire I've ever seen, guys. And in scripture, it says, if any two of you touch anything on earth that our Father in heaven We'll do it. So we made a long line of the guys on our team, and every person brought their burden board up to the front. We had a team member place their hand on that burden board. And we prayed a simple prayer, a prayer of repentance, that God would forgive us for the mistakes that we've made, right? And for, for me, just screwing things up and ending up where I was and how I was. Not about guilt, not about shame, but God, I just need you. So God, I repent that I've missed the mark. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And I released, I released those burdens. And I went home from that event and God took away so many of the temptations of the flesh that were just keeping me in bondage and keeping me 
with this broken identity of myself. I went home, had a conversation with my wife. I confessed some things, and I said, this is who I was, and this is who I'm committed to being moving forward. No longer will my flesh lead me. No longer will the feelings be the leader and the capacity for what the Weatherford family legacy will do. And I made a covenant promise with God when I got home from that event. I said, God, I've never felt your presence the way that I felt at that event. I know that you're real and I know that you're good. So for the next year, I'm going to take all of these skill sets that I've acquired in the physical of discipline and focus and obsession. And God, I'm going to place it all on you, all on you, everything that I have for one year. And God, even though I know you took so much away from me right away, God, I still feel like a little bit of depression, a little bit of anxiety, and I still have like tormenting thoughts. So God, I tell you what I'm going to do. I believe that you took away from me what I could not handle. And I believe that over this next year that I'm going to recondition my mind through your word, through prayer, and through getting around the right who. And God, if you can, if you can renew my mind and if you can heal my heart in one year, I will give you everything that I have. And the reason that I'm standing before you today is not because anybody paid me. I'm standing before you today saying no to my family because I'm saying yes to the covenant that I made to Jesus Christ because he set me free and I will never pass up an opportunity to grab a microphone to talk about his goodness. I will never pass up an opportunity to talk about how that price has already been paid and how, how so many of us have already maybe when we were younger like me have said yes to Jesus but then mistakes have happened and, and weight has been picked up and we've been conformed to the patterns of this world. And we call ourselves Christians, but we're not free. And so I want everybody to close their eyes. And you're gonna have your, your eyes closed for about five minutes. And I wanna explain to you with your eyes closed what the difference is between religion, which is what man made, and about relationship with God. So when I was 16 years old, my dad got me a 1986 Cadillac Fleetwood Broham, and I want you to imagine yourself being in the car with me. And we're driving down the road, and I see one of my friends that's watching, walking the opposite direction of us. And we're in this big, long car, so i got to sweep it out to the right a little bit before I can hit a U-turn so you and I can go pick up our friend. And as I'm taking the U-turn, you and I hear the crunch of the metal. And because you and I both know that my dad's old school, and my dad, if you make a mistake, you're going to pay the price, you're going to pay the consequences. And you and I, at the, at the same time, we hear the crunch of the metal, and we think to ourselves, ah, oh, shoot, i got to call my dad. He's going to freaking kill me. There's going to be a price to pay. My life is going to get worse. And that's what religion has taught each and every one of us, that we have to pay a price for freedom or authority. But relationship with God relationship with God is making that same mistake, guys. Hearing the crunch of the metal, but thinking to yourself, I got to call dad because he's going to know what to do. He's going to, he's going to know how to fix the situation. He's going to give me grace and mercy and forgiveness. And it wasn't until I encountered the Holy Spirit, God's presence, that I knew that God was real, that I knew that God was good, and I knew that God wasn't a religion. God is a relationship. So with your eyes closed, we're going to pray a prayer that's not about religion. It's about relationship. And also, before we pray that prayer, I want to give you another visual. Because there will come a day where each and every one of us, our body will expire and we will die. And our spirit will come out of our body and it will go up into a heavenly place. And there will be an angel holding a book. And that book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. And when you repent and you ask Jesus to come into your heart as your Lord and your Savior, your, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life in Jesus' blood, which means it can never be taken out. And then after that meeting, so we're going to pray a prayer for those of you that are, that are not real sure if your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're going to pray that prayer, and we're going to celebrate for the first time that you're going to give your life to Jesus, and things are going to be different. You're going you're gonna to cut things off. But then the meeting that I really want to talk to you about is the meeting that happens after that where you stand before God with your time, your talents, and your treasures. And for 36 years, guys, I'm 41. For 36 years, all I did was build my kingdom with my time, my talents, and my treasures. And I was broken, I was beaten, and I was defeated. But I was a millionaire, and everybody knew me. 
My entire life was about me. Before I pray this prayer, I want to show you, a, I want to show you in your mind a picture of this painting that I've recently saw. It's called The Allegory of Long Spoon. It's a picture of hell and a picture of heaven. There's 12 people sitting around a table in both paintings. And in both paintings, there's a huge Thanksgiving feast on both tables. But everybody sitting at the table has extraordinarily long spoons. It's very difficult for them to get the food and get it into their mouth. And so when you look at a picture of hell, it's gray. People are depressed and emaciated because everybody is taking their time, their talents, and their treasures trying to feed their own self. And if you take a picture of heaven, the circumstances are exactly the same. But the people that are sitting across the table from you are taking their time, their talents, and their treasures, and they're feeding you. So part of me being here today with you is to feed you with my time, my talents, and my treasures. So I want to pray a prayer with you where you can release the things that the world has placed on you and that you could receive something that you could never earn. Full forgiveness, a new identity to be a new creation. And then I'm going to ask you to do more than just ask Jesus to be your savior so you can go to heaven. I'm going to ask that you would commit to him being your Lord. The same way I see Andy being so convicted to give more of himself to God because he's experienced enough of the world to say, you know what, can only be God. I need, to, I need to bring myself closer to God and I wanna bring other people closer to God. So there's some music that I would love for you guys to pray or to play and then we're gonna walk through a prayer. And in that prayer, we're gonna release, we're gonna receive and we're gonna commit. And I believe that this is, this is going to be a new birthday for so many different people. A day where everything changed a day where you become a dangerous man. Oh That's why I can stand here before you with no fear as the most I dangerous man in the room because there's nothing that you can do to me. I can't die. People are saying, well, do you fear death? I welcome death. I look forward to meeting God face to face one day and telling him thank you for choosing me. Thank you for creating me for such a time as this. Thank you for putting me in front of these 500 people so I could light myself on fire so they could see a picture of possibility, so they could put down things that don't belong to them, so they could step into a new authority in Jesus Christ. So repeat these words after me. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or you want to rededicate your life, like me when you were 11, you're like, man, I gave my life to Jesus and the world killed me. Today's the day. Today's the day. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, we thank you for this incredible opportunity that we have on February 18th, 2024, where your sons and your daughters have an opportunity to gather under your name. God, to pursue excellence. God, to step into purpose and authority. If you want to give your life to Jesus right now, I would love for you to just turn the lights off. Turn them all the way down. Andy, will you come up here with me? With everybody's eyes closed, we're going to dim the lights. Nobody's looking. Nobody's looking. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the very first time, I want you to raise your hand. Three, two, one. Do it now. Be bold. Become a dangerous man. Praise God. I know that there's more. I know that there's more in here. There's the fear of man can leave now. If you feel like you're lost and you want more, you want to become a dangerous man and go from amateur to pro. God's talking to you right now. Raise your hand, three, two, one, do it now. Jesus, Jesus. Now, if you want to rededicate your life, you said, man, I gave up. You can put your hands down, first timers. Praise God. Now, if you're hearing me right now, and you're like, man, I got to rededicate my life. I thought I was coming down here for sales training. I came down here for salvation. I want you to raise your hand and rededicate your life to Jesus right now. Three, two, one, do it now. Become a dangerous man or woman. Become the type of person that won't compromise. Become the type of person that can't die. Jesus name. I want everybody inside of here. Just repeat these words after me. God, I want more of you and less of me. 
right now I repent of my sins. I've made mistakes. I've got trauma, God. I release my addictions, my trauma, and my past. God, would you forgive me? I want more of you and less of me. Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Not just for forgiveness, for power and authority. So I can overcome my flesh and step into the spirit of God. Right now, I release my past. I receive you, King Jesus, as my Savior, and I commit to you to be my Lord. And I commit to you to be my Lord. Now, I want everybody to put two hands up because a lot of you guys have walked in here hanging on to yesterday and I see an entire room of 500 men and women of God who have released their past and they are ready to receive what God has for them. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would fall. We ask that your Holy Spirit, your fire, your peace, your joy, your love, your patience, your kindness, your sound mind fall in this place. God, that you would allow your sons and your daughters to experience you for the first time an encounter with the Creator. God, we thank you in advance for the miracles that are going to happen to and through these men and women. God, right now we assign angels to their homes, angels to their marriages, angels to their businesses. The God, that you would deliver peace. God, that you would allow these men and these women to carry joy with them everywhere that they go, that they wouldn't operate by their flesh. God, that they would operate by the spirit of the living God, that everywhere that they go, the joy would spill out. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. With your eyes closed, with your eyes closed, if you gave your life to Jesus or you rededicated your life to Jesus, what I want you to do right now, I want you to pull your phone out and I want you to turn your light on when I count to three. Pull your phone out if you gave your life to Jesus. And I want you to turn your light on. Andy, are you ready for this? This is a picture of what heaven's going to look like. Three, two, one, turn your lights on. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, light up this whole room. Light up this whole room for Jesus. Angels are in heaven rejoicing for every single one of those lights. Praise, praise God right now. I want you to put your hands up and I just want you to say, God, I thank you. God, I praise you. God, I make a decision to cut off the old me and to receive the identity that you have for me. In Jesus Christ, amen. This week's episode is brought to you by Oxfit XS1. What's an XS1? It's without a doubt the most advanced and sophisticated exercise platform that I've ever seen. I actually have this exact unit in my home. The Oxfit XS1 blows my mind because of the capability and the durability. This is an at-home fitness platform that is industrial enough for me to max out my squat, my bench, and my deadlift with a real barbell in my hands. And it also has radical features like a rower, a ski erg, and live fitness classes on a massive three-foot touchscreen display. For more information, go to oxfit.com. And thanks for listening to the Steve Weatherford Show.